Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Mongol Academy Hub. You may have probably heard that Mongolian and Turkish languages are related or Mongolian and Turkish languages share a common ancestry. I've seen a large number of comments debating and discussing these questions, especially on social media. Is Mongolian language related to the Turkish language? Or do these two languages share a common ancestry? So in this video, we will answer these questions and learn about the basic concepts of linguistics and how to determine whether any given languages are genetically related or not, and why and how languages borrow words from one another. If you are new to this channel, my name is Hishke, I am from Mongolia, and my channel aims to give more research-based information and knowledge about Mongolia. And if you're interested in getting more research-based knowledge and information about Mongolia, please click the subscribe icon. And I'm very looking forward to going through this journey with all of you. So the first question, is Mongolian language related to the Turkish language? The short and straightforward answer to this question is no. But the long answer begs the question of how to determine whether any given two languages are related in the first place. If you find any similarities in, uh, between any pair of languages, is it because they are genetically related? Or is it a chance resemblance? Or is it because these two languages borrowed words from one another due to some historical context? So in this video, we will answer these questions. And now let's take a short tutorial about the two complementary approaches in linguistics. In linguistic science, there are two theoretical viewpoints. Synchrony and diachrony. Synchrony. A synchronic approach considers that all languages should or could be described without reference to history. In other words, synchronic linguistics aims at describing a language at a specific point of time, more often in the present time. Those who hold this synchronic approach is called structural linguists. The Swiss linguist, Fredenin de Saussure, is the prominent structural linguist. Saussure, for example, considers all languages could or indeed should be described without reference to history. According to Saussure, when we describe the language synchronically, we describe what are the basic units that make up the particular language, for example, phonemes, which is the perceptually distinct units of sound in a specified language that distinguish one word from another, morphemes, which is a meaningful morphological unit of a language that cannot be further divided. So according to the synchronic approach, Language is made up of a collection of units, such as phonemes and morphemes, to express meanings of the mental image in a speaker's head. So, the primary function of language is to express meanings and to convey the meanings to someone else. To convey the meanings of the mental image in a speaker's head, the speaker has to transform the mental image into some physical form. In other words, the mental image is decoded into a physical message. So, the mental image in a speaker's head and the physical form used to transfer this image are completely arbitrary. For example, let's see how the word for cat is decoded in different languages. Cat Katze Cat Cat Kot Kissa Kot Kot Kotka, Machka, Sha, Gato, Gato, Gato, Gata, Kid, Neko, Mao, Mao, Mora. As you notice. The word for cat in Chinese, Mongolian, Thai, and Vietnamese sounds very similar to the sound that cats make in general, the mewing sound, while the word for cat in Germanic and Slavic languages expresses more adorable and cute feelings, which reflects their mental image of cats. Diachrony. In contrast to synchrony, the diachronic approach considers that language should be described or studied through history. Those who hold this diachronic approach is called historical linguists. Historical linguistics considers that a language is a product of history and it changes and evolves through history. For example, 
if we compare two different words used by two different groups of people who speak different languages, and we find that they express similar or identical meaning by using similar or identical sounds, then we need to ask ourselves the simple question, why? For example, for the word for cat, we can see that it sounds similar in English, German, Danish, and Swedish, while the word for cat sounds very similar in Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. Also, the Russian and Polish languages have the identical sound for cat. We would presumably come to the conclusion that maybe it is because there is some natural connection between the meaning and the form that is being used to express it, or maybe the similarity says some kind of historical connection between the two languages. The historical connection between the two languages could logically be of two different kinds. First, it could be that copying or borrowing is involved. For example, the word for coffee is same or similar in English, Mongolian, and Russian, as this word is an introduced concept in these countries. Originally, coffee would have had no indigenous name in England, Russia, and Mongolia. Coffee is likely to be derived from the name of the region where coffee beans were first cultivated in southwestern Ethiopia, derived from Kaffa Province. As coffee passed on to more cultures, their names for the beverage seem to be derived from whoever they picked it up from. The Ottoman Turkish called it kahve, and then the Dutch called it kofi. It is likely that kofi entered the English language from the Dutch name in the late 1500s. When people come across things for which they have no name in their native language, they very frequently just copy the name from the language of the people who introduced the concept. Second, it could be that these forms that sound similar and have identical names all derive from a single set of original forms that has diverged differently in each case throughout the history. This brings us to the important concept of language relationship or proto-language. More specifically, for example, Proto-Turkic languages or Proto-Mongolic languages. The concept of language relationship considers that if two languages have a common origin, this means that they belong to a single family of languages. If two or three languages are derived from some other language, there was some ancestral language from which all the three were descended by changing in different ways. So, the concepts of language relationship and proto-language both rest on the assumption that languages change in certain systematic ways, but the related languages or proto-languages still show some similarities despite their changes that have gone through various ways. For example, Latin was the language of most of Western Europe at the time of Christ. However, as the centuries passed, Latin gradually changed in its spoken form in different parts of Europe in different ways in what is now Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, and Romania. The eventual result of this change was that there are different languages in Europe today called Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, and Romanian. Despite the diverging changes, these languages are all similar to some extent, because they all go back to a common ancestor. In this case. We can draw a family tree to describe the situation, and here the proto language actually has a name Latin. So the question of how can we determine the languages are genetically related. The majority of the scientific research sources suggests that if the given languages have a greater degree of similarities that are systematic and recur in large sets of words or lexical items, then it provides strong evidence that those languages are related or have a common ancestry. So, if the similarities are consistent in lexical classifications, such as nursery words like mom or dad, kinship words, pronouns, numbers, body parts, and elements of natural phenomena, etc., then they all derive from a single set of original forms that has diverged differently in each case throughout the history. If the lexical classifications not only sound similar but also correspond to meanings, then it is strong evidence that the two languages are related and have a common ancestry. In particular, if the more intimate lexical items such as family, body parts, colors, or environment are similar in phonology and morphology, then it provides strong evidence of genetic relationship, and are less likely that they are borrowed completely from another language. So we have now got some basic understanding of how to determine the genetic relationship between languages. The Latin and Germanic languages are the most thoroughly investigated by historical and comparative linguists in terms of understanding the genetic relationship between languages and whether or not the any given languages share a common ancestry. So now let's take a look at the kinship and nursery words in Latin or the so-called Romance languages.
They provide a very good illustrative example for understanding the relationship between languages and the common ancestors shared by languages. Famille. Famille. Famille. Famille. Famille. Mère. Mama. Madre. Madre. Mãe. Mama. Mama. Mama. Mama. Mãe. Père. Tata. Padre. Padre. Pai. Papa. Tata. Papa. Papa. Pai. Sœur. Sora. Sorella. Hermana. Irmã. Frère. Frate. Fratello. Hermano. Irmão. Oncle. Onkyul. Zio. Tio. Tio. Tante. Matusha. Zia. Tia. Tia. We can see that there are consistent and systematic similarities in lexical classifications for intimate family and kinship words in all these Latin languages. At the same time, we can see some divergence for those words like sister or brother in Spanish and Portuguese languages. But overall, the similarities are still consistent and systematic for all other Latin languages. So now let's compare the Mongolian with Turkish. I chose Halkh Mongolian spoken by the Mongolian people from Mongolia because it is the best known member of the Mongolic languages family. As for Turkish, the classification of the Turkic languages is complicated because of the migration of Turkic peoples and their consequential intermingling with one another or uh, with people who spoke non-Turkic languages. So this situation made it very complex to classify some languages as Turkic, for example, the Chowash language. But I chose a Turkish language to compare with Mongolian because it is the most widely spoken of all the Turkic languages with around 80 to 90 million speakers. So now let's check how the Mongolian and Turkish words compare. Geribul. Aile, ich, anne, ich, anne, itzik, baba, av, baba, ich, kız kardeş, ah, erkek kardeş, avak, amca, nagat, kala. We can see that the lexical classifications for family and kinship words are completely different in both morphology and phonology in Mongolian and Turkish languages. In other words, these words don't sound similar in both Mongolian and Turkish languages and are completely different in physical forms or for their spelling. If the chosen languages have a greater degree of similarities that are systematic and recur in a large sets of words for lexical items, uh, then it provides a strong evidence that those languages are related or have a common ancestry, which is the case for Latin languages, but we don't see any such similarities for Mongolian and Turkish languages. So now let's take a look at the numbers uh, and how numbers sound in Latin languages. Please stay tuned. Une, un, uno. Una, uno. Una, uno. Uma, um, du, doa, due, dos, duas, dois, trois, três, três, três, três, quatro, quatro, quatro, quatro, quatro, cinco, cinco, cinco, cinco, cinco, cinco, seis, chasse, seis, seis, seis. Set, chapte, sete, siete, sete, huit, opt, otto, ocho, oito, neuf, neuf, nove, nove, nove, nove, dix, zece, dez, dez, dez. Again, we can now see the lexical classification for numbers are similar in both phonology and morphology with a slight divergence but it still maintains the consistent similarities in all Latin languages. We can also see that all Latin languages except for Romanian have a gender. 
So now let's take a look at how numbers sound and compare in Mongolian and Turkish languages. Nek, bir, hayır, iki, qora, üç, duru, dört, tav, beş, zurga, altı, dala, yedi, nem, sekiz, yüz, dokuz, arav, on. For lexical classifications for numbers, we can also see that there are no consistent or systematic similarities in both Mongolian and Turkish languages. In other words, the numbers in Mongolian and Turkish languages are completely different in both phonology and morphology. Now, let's check how random vocabularies sound and compare in Latin languages. Creative. Creative. Creative. Creativa. Creativo. Creativa. Creativo. Creativa. Creativo. Mieux. Mai bine. Meglio. Mejor. Melhorar. Ete. Vara. Estate. Verano. Verão. Livro. Carte. Libro. Libro. Libro. O. Apa. Aqua. Água. Água. Pui. Ploie. Piovere. Piovia. Chuva. Air. Air. Aria. Aire. Ar. Ciel. Cer. Cielo. Cielo. Céu. Vert. Ver. Verde. Verde. Verde. Again, we can see that the lexical classifications for adjectives such as creative and better and nouns for items such as book or natural phenomena like rain, water, sky are all similar in both phonology and morphology in all these Latin languages. Now let's check how the random vocabularies sound and compare in Mongolian and Turkish languages. Butech, yaratıcı, itlu sen, daha iyi, zon, yaz, nam, kitap, us, su, bara, yağmur, agar, hava, tingir, gökyüzü, nagan, yeşil. We can now see that there are no consistent and systematic similarities in lexical classifications for intimate family words and kinship terms, numbers, and natural phenomena, and other random vocabularies in both Mongolian and Turkish languages. So this is the strong case that Mongolian and Turkish languages are not genetically related and do not share a common ancestry. We can see the stark differences in how the words sound between Mongolian and Turkish languages, but we can see the robust similarities in both the sound, spelling, and meaning in Latin language. If resemblances between two languages are significantly greater than chance, then it provides a strong evidence that these two languages are genetically related. This is a commonly accepted methodology developed by genetic linguists to establish a hypothesis about the genetic relationship between two languages. We have seen that the Latin or Romance languages provide very strong evidence that they are genetically related and share a common ancestry, as the resemblances are greater than a chance and very systematic and recur in a large set of words and lexical classifications. If two languages have words that sound similar and have similar spelling, like similar physical forms, but carry completely different meanings, then there is a chance resemblance. For example, in Mongolian language, there is a word called bilcer, which means pasture. The English language has also a word called Bilcher, which means a person who burps or who bloats. And the second meaning of this belcher in English is a handkerchief worn around the neck. So these two words, uh, Bilcher in Mongolian and Belcher in English, sound similar and similar in a physical form, uh, which means in terms of its uh, spelling but they carry a completely different meanings. 
So this is a chance resemblance. And of course we know that the English and Mongolian are completely unrelated languages. But by chance, these two languages happen to have a word that sounds similar and also have similar spelling but carry a completely different meaning. Therefore, in order to make meaningful comparisons, we must eliminate the chance resemblance. And I have come across with many people who claim that the Mongolian and Turkish languages are related, and most often those people point to chance resemblances. For example, in Mongolian there is a word called bayin, which means rich. So in Turkish language also has a word which, means, which is called bayan but it means in Turkish language miss or missus. So we can see that these two words, bayang in Mongolian and bayang in Turkish, sound similar and have similar spelling like forms, but they carry a completely different meaning. So this is a chance resemblance. So we should eliminate or avoid a chance resemblance when we compare two languages to determine whether they are genetically related or not. So we can now see that the core vocabularies in both Turkish and Mongolian are different in phonology and morphology, but both the Proto-Turkic and Proto-Mongolic languages share some vocabularies that they borrowed from each other due to historical contexts in various stages of history. So now let's take a quick course on how and why languages copy or borrow words from one another. Please stay tuned. Languages copy words from other languages that are either related or unrelated as a result of cultural and historical contacts between countries and nationalities. Technological innovations such as television, internet, computer, artificial intelligence, various empires stretching its conquest in the world history such as Roman Empire, British Empire, Mongol Empire, Spanish Empire, Ottoman Empire, and Russian Empire, as well colonies such as British Colony, Portuguese Colony, Dutch Colony are the perfect examples that brought lexical copying between languages in different periods of history. If the speakers of a given language take over new cultural items, new technical and scientific terminologies, new religious concepts, or references to foreign locations, fauna, flora, then there is obviously a need for the vocabulary to express these concepts and references. Borrowing or copying words occurs when the speaker takes over the foreign word together with the foreign article or idea. For example, the word coffee was originated from the Ethiopian province of Kaffa, where coffee was first cultivated and entered the English language in 1582 via the Dutch coffee, borrowed from the Ottoman Turkish coffee. In the local Ethiopian language, Amharic, the word for coffee is bun or buna, and coffee was sometimes referred to as kaffa bun, which means coffee from kaffa. For this reason, some believe that the term coffee bean is an anglicization of kaffa bun. Now let's listen how the word coffee is copied to different languages. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee. When a language copies words from another language, the copied word may take on a form and a meaning that have elements of both the receiving language and the source language. In other words, when we borrow foreign words, we need to nativize them in our own native language, especially phonetically. We can see that the word coffee has been nativized in many languages while still retains its original roots in its both sound and form. Today, with the advent of technology, many words such as computer, internet, and digital have entered into many different related and unrelated languages. Now, let's check how the word internet has been nativized in different languages. Internet. Internet. L'internet. Internet. Internet. Internet. Internet. Internet. Internet. Internet. Here again, we can see how the word for internet 
has been nativized in many languages, while still retains its original roots in its both sound and form. For example, the Mongolian language has many borrowed words from the Russian language due to linguistic and historical contacts as well as geographic proximity. Those borrowed words have been Mongolized phonetically. Such a convergence doesn't mean that Mongolian and Russian languages are related or share a common ancestor. And in any given language, when a language copies words from another language, the core vocabularies such as the intimate nursing words like mom and dad, kinship words like brother and sister, numbers, natural phenomena, and colors often retain their original form, but the copied or loan words are added to the core vocabularies of the language. Now, let's learn about what convergence means in various relations between different languages. Languages can also converge or come to resemble each other structurally and phonetically as a result of a long period of linguistic contact and mutual interference. For example, one of the classical examples of convergence is found in the area of Balkans in the southeastern Europe that is a home to different languages, which belong to five distinct subgroups of the Indo-European languages such as Bulgarian, Macedonian, Serbo-Croatian, which are all Slavic languages, and Romanian, Albanian, and Modern Greek, as well as Romani, which is the Indo-Aryan language of the so-called Gypsies. These distinct Indo-European languages intermingled with the Turkish language during the Ottoman Empire period in the region. In a similar pattern, the Northeast Asia is a home to many different languages that belong to six distinct language groups, such as Sino-Tibetan, Mongolic, Tumguzic, Koreanic, Japonic, and Slavic. Therefore, a certain kind of language convergence occurred in different periods of the history depending on different geopolitically conditioned relations between China, Mongolia, Russia, Japan, North Korea, and South Korea. It has been hypothesized for a long time that the Mongolian language belongs to the Altaic language family that would include the Mon Turkic, Mongolic, Tungusic languages and also possibly Japanese and Korean languages. But this hypothetical Altaic language family has long been rejected by most of the comparative linguists in the field of linguistic science. However, there is still a minority of scholars who continue to support this Altaic language family hypothesis, mostly as a basis of uh, Turanism. So Turanism is a multi-ethnic nationalist movement and a pseudo-scientific pan-Turanic cultural and political movement. The pan-Turanic movement claims that the ethnic groups such as Turks, Mongols, Finns, Estonians, Hungarians, as well as some other small ethnic groups from Siberia and Eurasia are culturally, ethnically and linguistically related. But in reality, these ethnic groups have different ethnogenesis and different culture and different language. So it's more like a political ideology than it is based on scientific evidence. So another popular argument that supports the Altaic language family is that the so-called Altaic languages such as Mongolic, uh, Turkic, Tungusic, and Koreanic and Japanic languages share the same syntax structure characterized by subject, object, verb, word order. For example, instead of saying I love you, in those so-called Altaic languages it would be said like I you love, subject, object, verb. But this is not an indicator to hypothesize that these languages are genetically related because there are many languages that are unrelated but have the same syntax structure characterized by subject, object, verb, word order. For example, here is the list of the languages that have the same syntax structure with subject, object, verb, word order. So as you can see from the list, the classical Latin and Tibetan and nearly all other tibeto burman languages and also the Indo, all Indo-Iranian languages. They all have the same syntax structure that is characterized by subject, object, verb, word order. Also, I have read uh, from linguistic sources that the standard Mandarin and also Dutch and German, 
and some Romance languages can become also subject, object, verb, word order, depending on their grammatical rules and generative grammar and uh, grammatical conditions. But I cannot explain those gr grammatical rules and grammatical conditions because I don't speak these languages. But I know Russian, and Russian is a conventionally a subject, verb, object language, but it is very common in Russian that sometimes the sentence structure becomes subject, object, verb. For example, in conventional Russian typology, you can say, Я люблю тебе, I love you, subject, verb, object. But it is very common in spoken Russian that it becomes Я тебе люблю. In other words, I you love, subject, object, verb. The another example in Russian is that Они понимали меня, which is the conventional Russian syntax structure, but it is very common that it becomes Они меня понимали, which means they, me, and stood, subject, object, verb. So therefore, it is not an indicator to hypothesize that these languages are genetically related or belong to the Altaic language family because they have the syntax structure characterized by subject, object, verb. Because as we can see in the list, there are many languages that are genetically unrelated but have the same syntax structure with subject, object, verb. But today, the Altaic language family is still referenced in many encyclopedias, handbooks, and scholarly references, unfortunately. The another popular argument by those who support the Altaic language family hypothesis is that the Turkic, Mongolic, Tungusic languages are all agglutinative. Agglutinative is a type of language where words are made of different types of morphemes to determine their meaning. Again, it's not based on the sound reasoning because there are many languages that are agglutinative but unrelated. So here is the list of languages that are agglutinative. And as you can see from the list, the Austronesian languages, which includes Indonesian, Malay, and Tagalog, spoken by Filipino people. And also the Bantu languages, which is spoken in Central Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. And also the tibeto burman languages and Mesoamerican languages are all agglutinative. So therefore, it's not a sound reasoning to claim that Turkic and Mongolic languages are genetically related because they are agglutinative. As we can see, there are many languages that are agglutinative but are not related. Since the 1950s, the comparative linguists found out that the vocabularies shared by both the Proto-Turkic and Proto-Mongolic languages are not cognates but those shared vocabularies were found to be converging rather than diverging over the centuries. In other words, the Turkic and Mongolic languages share some loan words that they borrowed from each other, but those loan words have been converged or nativized in each language. But other than that, these languages do not share a common ancestry and are not genetically related. So now let's dive into the historical context between Proto-Mongolic and Proto-Turkic languages. And please stay tuned. Thank you very much. The Proto-Turkic languages and Proto-Mongolic languages share some vocabularies due to the cultural contacts in different stages of history, as well as the geographic proximity of Mongols with various Turkic-speaking Siberian indigenous people, including Tuans, Yakuts, Altains, as well as other Central Asian Turkic people such as Uyghur, Kazakh, and Kyrgyz. 
There isn't much research conducted on determining whether the shared vocabularies have the Mongolic origin or Turkic origin. In the early history, many loanwords entered the Mongolic languages from the Proto-Bulgaric languages during the Hunnu Empire. The Hunnu Empire was the politically dominant power on the steppes of East Asia, centered on the Mongolian plateau around 300 BC until the late 4th century AD. The Hunnu were also politically active, stretching its power in areas now part of Siberia and Russia, Inner Mongolia, Gansu and Xinjiang in China. Although the linguistic affiliation of the Hunnu proper is still a matter of dispute in academia, the Paro-Mongolic languages were the main language of Hunnu Empire, and its political confederation contained a significant Bulgar component along with Paro-Mongolic languages. The period of Bulgar's influence on Mongolic languages apparently lasted until the 4th century AD, when the Bulgars withdrew to the West. According to the archaeological, anthropological, and genetic evidence, it is widely considered that Bulgars were the ancestors of the present-day Chowash people. Today, the only surviving member of the Proto-Bulgaric language group is the Chowash language. Chowash is the native language of Chowash people who live in European Russia, primarily in Chowash Republic in Volga region and adjacent areas. Chowash language has very distinct features and cannot be understood by other Turkic speakers whose languages have varying degrees of mutual intelligibility within their respective subgroups. So that's why many of those loan words that enter the Mongolic languages from Chowash language cannot correspond to the standard Turkish and other common Turkic languages for both their meaning and sounds. Some scholars, in particular the Italian historian and philologist Igor de Rachwiltz, noted a significant distinction of the Chowash language from other Turkic languages. According to Rachwiltz, the Chowash language does not share certain common characteristics with Turkic languages to such a degree that it can be considered as an independent Bulgaric language family similar to Uralic and Turkic languages. Also, it is important to note that Chowash people have different ethnogenesis from the other Turkic people and are culturally more similar to Finno-Ugric people. In terms of their religion and spiritual belief, the majority of Chowash people living in the Chowash Republic of Russia are Orthodox Christian, while some still practice to their traditional indigenous beliefs, which is more nature-centric dualistic and based on the principles of worshipping the sun and honoring their ancestors. In addition to Chowash language, the Tuvan and Yakut languages show the strongest impact of the earlier contacts between Mongolic and Turkic languages. Of the modern Turkic languages, the northeastern Siberian branches of Turkic languages spoken by Tuvans, Yakut and Altai people show the strongest traces of Mongolic influence. The proportion of Mongolic loanwords in Tuvan, Yakut and Altai languages has been estimated at 20 to 30 percent of the total vocabulary. It is also important to note that Tuvans, Yakut and Altai people have different ethnogenesis from the Kipchak and Oghuz Turks from Turkey, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, as well as the Crimean Tatars in Russia's Tatarstan. That's why they are culturally different from those Oghuz and Kipchak Turks. Tuva, officially the Republic of Tuva, is a Republic of Russian Federation and lies at the geographical center of Asia and southern Siberia. The Republic of Tuva borders the Altai Republic to the west, Hakasia, Krasnoyarskrai, Irkutsk Oblast in the north, Buryatia to the east, and shares an international border with Mongolia to the south. Historically, Tuva had been part of Mongolia since 1759, when Mongolia was under the Manjo Qin Dynasty. As the Qin Dynasty fell in 1911, 
The revolution in Mongolia also started leading to the independence of both Mongolia and Tuvan Orianha Republic. After a period of political uncertainty, the new republic became a part of the Russian Empire in 1914, known as Orianha Krai, and was eventually replaced by the nominally independent Tuvan People's Republic in 1921 as recognized only by its two neighbors, the Soviet Union and Mongolia. So later in 1944, it was annexed into the Soviet Union. A majority of the population are ethnic Tulans who speak Tulan as their native tongue, along with Russian as an official language. Tulans are the direct descendants of the indigenous Southern Siberian people. The traditional religion of Tuans is a type of Tingrism or Shamanism and Tibetan Buddhism, and Tuans retain distinct Mongol cultural elements as well. The proportion of Mongolic loanwords in Tuan language has been estimated approximately 30% of their total vocabulary. Yakuts, who also go by the name Saha, are Paleo-Asian people who live in the Saha Republic in Russia. Historically, between the 11th and 13th centuries, Yakuts moved from the south of the Altaisan region as pressed by the expansion of Mongols to the Lina River Basin, which is the coldest place in the world and they were eventually mixed with the indigenous populations of Mongolic origin and Tungusic-speaking Evenks and Yukigurs, thereby forming the Yakuts. In the following centuries, the Yakuts is spread over the vast northeastern region of Siberia. When Russians began to invade their territory in the 1630s, the Yakuts were settled between the Lena, Amga, and Altin rivers, located about 450 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. The culture of the Yakut people is similar to that of Tungusic people native to northeastern Siberia and the Arctic. While most of Yakuts are at least nominally Orthodox Christians, still many retain their ancient religion, or Tingrism, which is a part of sun worship with shamanistic practices and other aspects of indigenous Saha culture. Their language is Yakut, also known as Saha, which is considered as a Siberian branch of the Turkic languages, but different from all other Turkic languages in the presence of a layer of vocabulary of unclear origin, possibly the Paleo-Siberian. There is also a large number of words of Mongolian origin related to ancient borrowings, as well as numerous recent borrowings from Russian. Yakut or Saha languages is spoken by around 450,000 native speakers, primarily the ethnic Yakuts and it is one of the official languages of Saha Republic along with Russian. The Altai people, also called the Altaians, are indigenous people of Siberia, mainly living in the Altai Republic in Russia. Several thousand of the Altaians also live in Mongolia, mostly in Mongolian parts of Altai mountain regions and in northern Xinjiang in China. The Altaians in Mongolia and China are not officially recognized as distinct ethnic group. The Altaians are represented by two ethnographic groups, the Southern Altaians, who speak the Southern Altai dialect, and the Northern Altaians, who speak the Northern Altai language or dialect. Some Altaians are Orthodox Christians as a result of the broader missionary campaign by Russian Empire in the 19th century, but others practice a unique religion known as Burkhnism or Altai faith, which combines Tibetan Buddhism and Orit Mongol folk rituals. 
The Mongolic language's contact with Kipchak and August Turks occurred in the 13th century when the Mongol Empire stretched its conquest to Central Asia, most of Eurasia, and part of Middle East. The medieval Mongols effectively mobilized the August and Kipchak Turkic populations to rule the West Asia, including Russia. Some of the Proto-Mongolic languages share some contact-induced origin of lexical similarities with the Proto-Turkic languages due to the greater interactions occurred during the Mongol Empire period in the 13th century. During the Mongol Empire period, the Mongolic languages were serving as the official language of diplomacy and political affairs. So the predominant flow of influence was from Mongolic to Turkic. And there was a strong Middle Mongol lexical impact on Middle Turkic in the 13th and 14th centuries. In addition to a new military and social organization, the Mongols also introduced words of Mongolic origin for special kinds of horse breeding, animal husbandry, metalworking, and housing structures to Kipchak and August Turks. Also, some loan words of Turkic origin entered the Middle Mongolic languages from Uyghurs in Xinjiang in China in the 12th century. The another wave of Mongolic impact on Turkic languages, especially on Central Asian and Caucasus Turks such as Kipchak and Oguz, was connected with the rise of the Erd Mongol Empire in the 15th century. At the beginning of the 17th century, the Telmic Mongol tribes, or we call Hedmic in Mongolian, reached the lower Volga region, escaping the civil war in Mongolia. So that's why the old Mongolian language has significant proto-Turkic influence in their phonology. Now let's check some long words that both the Mongolian and Turkish languages share. As I mentioned before, there isn't much research conducted to determine whether those loan words are of Mongolic origin or Turkic origin. But I chose some loan words that are known to be of Mongolic origin and Turkic origin. I also present some loan words shared by both the Mongolian and Turkish languages, but are unknown whether they are of Mongolic origin or Turkic origin. And also, I would like to note that it would be more viable to compare the Mongolian language with those Siberian branches of Turkic languages such as Tuvan and Yakut languages, because the proportion of Mongolic loanwords in Tuvan and Yakut languages has been estimated approximately 30% of their total vocabulary. So please stay tuned and thank you very much. Han, Kam, Su, Sut, Ist, Ich. Elsen zul. Çöl. Alt. Altan. Altan. Tomur. Demir. Ulan buğday. Buğday. Sarımız. Sarımsak. Arslan. Aslan. Tengiz. Deniz. İhir. İkiz. Also, there are words that sound similar but have slightly different meanings in common Turkic and Mongolic languages. For example, the word for country in Mongolian is Ols, but the word for nation in uh, common Turkic is Olus. So these similarities are often regarded as evidence of genetic relationship between the Mongolic and Turkic languages by early Western Turkologists. But with the progress of research, it has become increasingly obvious that these are just borrowings representing the different layers of interactions between Proto-Turkic and Proto-Mongolic populations at different stages of history. So as we can see, indeed these borrowings are random in character, but the basic vocabularies in both uh, Mongolic and Turkish languages, such as the kinship terms, numerals and proverbs, prepositions, postpositions and adverbs, nouns and the common verbs are different in both Turkish and Mongolian languages.
Also, we can see that many of the borrowed words refer to the technology such as iron working or material culture such as agriculture or horse objects, which were often borrowed along with the cultural or technological interactions between the Proto-Turkic and Proto-Mongolic populations. So these patterns are not diagnostic enough to claim that Mongolic and Turkic languages are genetically related or, or share a common ancestry. So therefore, we must separate borrowings from the native elements in order to diagnose whether or not the pair of languages are genetically related. The another reason that Mongolic languages were incorrectly classified as Altaic or related to Turkic languages by early comparative linguists is because in the history of Mongolic studies, the peripheral Mongolic languages were often neglected and were not uh, well documented up to the present day. So this contributed to incorrectly assigning the Mongolic languages to the Altaic language family group along with the Turkic languages. And it is unfortunate that many of those uh, peripheral Mongolic languages are rapidly disappearing. Even the more viable ones are uh, becoming at risk because of the dominance of more powerful and regional languages. So again, I would like to mention that not only the Mongolic languages borrowed words from the Proto-Turkic languages, the Mongolic languages have also interacted with the neighboring non-Mongolic languages such as Chinese, Russian and Tibetan. Tibetan has so closely interacted with the Mongolic languages because of the Tibetan Buddhism. So now we have two guests uh, who is a native Mongolian speaker and a native Turkish speaker. And these two wonderful ladies will share some basic words and conversations to see if the Mongolian and Turkish languages have any similarities. And please stay tuned and thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I'm so glad uh, and feel lucky like to be part of this like a introductive, exclusive YouTube channel. So my name is Müge, uh, Müge Çelik Örücü. I'm originally from Turkey. I have been living in Canada for four years. I have previous experience of become, being a visiting uh, professor previously. So that was the opportunity when we have a chance to meet each other. I'm working as a registered clinical counselor. I have a PhD on counseling psychology, and I am also teaching at Adler University as an adjunct professor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a few Turkish words as a greeting. So Marhaba. Marhaba. Marhaba. Marhaba. Marhaba. <laughs> Yes, merhaba. merhaba, iyi günler. Merhaba, iyi günler. İyi, i̇yi günler, like, uh, i̇yi good günler. day. Mm. İyi, i̇yi günler, or selamlar. Би сайн сүүлийн хэлсэн үг нь инженерш гэж ойлголоо. А нөө инженерш гэдэг цохиол байдаг шүү дээ. Тэрний нэр хэлж байгаа юм гэж бодохгүй. Салам. Салам. Салам. Салам гэнэ. Салам. It means like greetings, greetings. Salam means greetings. <laughs> or or one, one la last word like hoş geldiniz. It means welcome. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no worries. It's like, actually, in English, we don't have that much greeting words when we try to translate it. But hoş geldiniz means welcome. Uh, selamlar. 
Hoş geldiniz. Değil mi? Değil mi? Değil mi? Willkommen gegen Visa. Ya, ich habe noch da etwas zu And the other one is iyi günler. Like, uh, good day. Good day. Like, have a good day. It's iyi günler. Can you say that again? İyi günler. İyi günler. İyi günler. İyi günler. Have a good day. Mm-hmm. Welcome in Mongolian is Tafta Merl. Tafta Merl. Tafta Merl. Tafta Merl. Yeah. Have a good day in Mongolian is Utrik Sahin Ongrulere. Ut Utri Ut Utrik Sahin Ongrulere. Utrik Sahin Ongrulere. Utrik Sahin Ongrulere. Utrik Sahin Ungrutere, you and me, San Beno. Mm-hmm. No, it means hello. <laughs> okay, San Beno. Okay, hello, San Beno. That's how I can do it. Sahan sausage, no. Sahan sausage, no. Sahan penenkero. Is it the same hello or something different? Sahan sausage, Beno. Is it again like welcome? And Sam Benu means hello in Mongolian. And also Benu. Dr. Prusser asked Sahin Sausage Benu, which means it's also a kind of a greeting in Mongolian that's related to our culture, which means are you having a good summer? Oh. Depending on the season, we also greet like, are you having a good summer? Are you having a good winter? Are okay. you having a good springs? Anne. Anne. Anne. Anne. <laughs> Anne. Mother. Um, mother of age. Age. Mm-hmm. Age. Yeah. Age. Age. Age. Age. Mm-hmm. Okay. Baba. Baba. Baba was mother of our children. Is it fa- father? Pasa, which is right? When he did, he also was in the world. He's in your head. It's father, okay. Father, yes. Father, yeah. Ah, In Mongolian, father is av, like A A V. Okay. Uh-huh. Like a uh, car. Car. Car. Car. It's about natural phenomena. Car. Snow. Car. car. Snow. Sasik car. Mongol dair ol da. Tasal. Gek bach dimi. Bas yag yu gharn ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol ol But in Mongolian, snow is tas. Tas. Uh-huh. Sas. Sas. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Yamur. Yamur. Yamur. Yamur. Yamur. Is it a question for what? Like a question word? What? Uh, rain. Yamur. Borog. Borog Yamur. Oh. In Mongolian, rain. Borog. Boro. Mm-hmm. Aro. Ora. Ora. Ora. Bora. B. B. Bora. Okay. Ora. Is it B O R A? B O R O O. Bora. Bora. Yeah. Okay. We have Bora, like B O R A. It is a kind of wind. Ah, uh, okay. Wind, say, wind in Mongolian is. Uh, setih. Setih. It is setih. Setih. 
Ja. Selv. Selv. Mm-hmm. Ja. Det er det. Uh, wind means rusgar. Rusgar. Rusgar. Rusgar. R R U Z G A R. Rusgar. Rusgar. Yes, yes. Perfect. Perfect. Great. And um, uh, is it something like environment or animal or anything like emi? Emi. Emi. Uh huh. Emi. Emi. Emi. Is it uncle? No, it means no. It's a grandma, grandmother. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uir. Uir. Uir. Uh huh. Uir. Uvir, is it like kinship word again? Uvir. Uir. No. Uir. Uh-huh. It means like sleeping? Uir. Mm-hmm. Uir. It means flat. Flat, okay. Yeah. Deve. Means camel. Deve. D-E-V-E. Deve. Camel. Ime. Yeah. <laughs> Ime. <laughs> Did you say de deve? Deve. D e v e. Deve. deve. Camel. Deve. Camel. Deve. Deve. Deve. So now we can go with the uh, loan words, but we can say sentence using the loan words that both Mongolic and Turkic languages share. Okay. So, elma ile süt içmek. Kan şekerini düzenler. Drinking milk when eating an apple helps to regulate your blood sugar. Elma, elma means apple. Elma, elma mean ben değil mi? Elma. Mm-hmm. Is it the same? Apple? Apple? Mm-hmm. In Mongolian is efem. Efem. Efem. Elma. Elma ile süt içmek kan şekerini düzenler, which means drinking milk when eating an apple helps to regulate your blood sugar. And also like twin, twin means ikiz, ikizler. The twins have an allergy to wheat. Mm. İkizlerin buğday alerjisi var. Mm. Okay. In Turkish, I have no clue about what you're saying. Bi tingi suzuk durte. Tingis. <laughs> Tingis. Tingis. What could be like wheat? Wheat. Be. Be. Be. Be. Be. Be. Tingis. Be. Tingis. What could uh-huh. that be? Tingis. Utsik. Dorte. It could be something like we eat or do you like it? No, I don't. I have no clue again. And it means I like watching the sea. Oh, okay. Tingis, tingis means mm-hmm. uh-huh. tingis is sea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I don't think that we have so many similarities, but I think that when we start talking to each other, we will come up with so many different words. So we will understand each other while we were mentioning or like emphasizing any other word. So mm-hmm. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. So I want to learn content at the Arzol. Timmy was over his and I was like, he was not just a son, she was a son, she was a son, she was a son, she was a son, she was а харилцахд бол одоо нэг тийм бас тийм хялбар бол байхгүй юм байна. Ялаач одоо ямар ч хэлээд бол хоорондоо тийм амархан ингээ шууд ойлголцсон мэдээж хэцүү энд яг үнэн жишээр Монгол хэл төрх хэл хэвч гэсэн бас ялаач одоо төрх хэл биш юм байна гэсэн анхны тас сэтгэлд төрж байна. Ингээд таны одоо цаашдын одоо ажилд дамжилт хүсье мөн одоо доктор мюг оо тийм багш юм уу бас баярлаа таны цаашдын одоо судалгааны шинжилгээний ажил Thank you very much everyone who made it this far to watch my episode about the historical and linguistic contacts between the Proto-Mongolic and Proto-Turkic languages. 
and I will provide the reference sources in the description box below. In general, these three books will give you very solid knowledge and understanding of historical linguistics and language history, language change, and language relationship, as well as the comparative methods in historical linguistics and how to determine the relatedness and relationship between languages. This is very good on the introduction to historical linguistics. It's the fourth edition. So, and this is the first edition of this uh, introduction to historical linguistics. This is the fourth edition and this is the first edition. Also this one, language history, language change and language relationship. Trends in linguistics. So as for Mongolic languages, uh, you can check the Mongolic languages edited by uh, Professor Yuha Yanhunin. I don't have the hard copy of this book, but I only have the digital copy. And Professor Yuha Yanhunin is a Finnish linguist and a professor in East Asian Studies at the University of Helsinki. And uh, Professor Yanhunin has done very extensive field work on the peripheral Mongolic languages and Samoyotic languages is spoken by the Siberian and Subarctic indigenous people around the Ural Mountains in the northernmost Eurasia. So I will provide all the details in the description box below. And my next episode will most probably be about the Mongolic languages. And if not, then it will be coming soon after my second episode. So stay tuned. And please click the subscribe icon and like and share if you are finding value in this kind of videos. And thank you everyone and see you next time. Bye.